Hello and welcome to the Gainline Wales Online's live rugby show. I'm your host, Ben James, and I'm joined by Matthew Southcombe and Simon Thomas to discuss Wales's team to face Ireland in their Six Nations opener. Wayne Pivak named his 23 earlier today. Uh, let's get straight into it then, gents. Um, well, we, we, we largely knew what was coming, didn't we? So it's as expected. But Matt, what's your, what's your make of the, uh, the side? Yeah, um, it is as expected after the um, the Adams news broke uh, earlier this week. Uh, looking at it, I don't really know what else Pivac could have really done uh, in terms of, in terms of his selection. Uh, you look at the forward pack, and it's it's not too disrupted. Um, you know, I, there's a lot to like about Wales up front, uh, but behind the scrum is when we're really going to see you know how the combinations work and and whether whether things pay off. Um, my initial thought was that. I'm not entirely convinced about the move to centre for George North. Um, you know, he's he's been playing so well on the wing for the Ospreys over Christmas, uh, and really looks like he's he's almost rediscovered that form um, from his from his best years. So I, I would have been inclined to just leave him there um, and let him let him cause his problems from the wing, um, and look to bring in an Owen Watkin type at outside centre who's played very well. Um, I suppose if you do that, then there's not a lot of of uh, subtlety to your midfield, um, but I, I'm not sure North brings that that subtlety anyway. To be honest, um, it's still a very physical and direct midfield with uh, Johnny Williams in there. Um, so my inclination would have been to to leave George North on the wing, uh, where he's been playing well, and and look to someone like Owen Watkin, who ironically isn't even in the 23, um, with Nick Tompkins getting a nod on the bench. Um, but that's the only real sticking point for me. Um, no, I think there's I got a, a bit of a concern there. Um, defensively as well, uh, you know, typically it's not a part of the field. Wales have defended well in the last few year, in the last year or so under Pivac. Um, and you look at that Irish midfield with Robbie Henshaw and Gary Ringrose. You know that that's a very you know with Sexton in there as well pulling the strings. It's a very creative midfield, um, and it's going to be a very difficult ask for George North to defend that channel. So I, I would have probably left him where he was playing well uh, over the last few weeks out on the wing. Uh, but as it is, he, he moves into midfield and, and Amos gets the nod. I, I suppose that's, that's where a lot of the comments uh, early on are coming from. And I guess there's um, a fair bit of surprise uh, Hallam Amos thrown sort of straight into the starting lineup. Obviously, he didn't play for Wales at all last year throughout the whole of 2020. Simon, um, what, what can we expect from, from Hallam after so long out? Yeah, I've just been writing a piece about Hallam. It's interesting, isn't it? I was talking to Matt about this earlier. Hallam Amos has scored test tries against New Zealand, South Africa, Australia and Argentina. There's only what two other Welshmen have done that in test rugby that I could see, and that's Shane Williams and Gareth Thomas. So he's in decent try scoring company there. And he's had 22 caps for Wales. He's tended to be quite steady. And there'd be some quality finishes in his six tries. But as I was saying to Matt as well, people seem to remember one game in particular, not against <laughs> one of the great guns, not, and I remember a game where he didn't score a try, and that was, of course, the World Cup game against Uruguay in uh, in Japan in 2019. And just one of those days where it really didn't go right for him. He could have had a hat-trick of tries, in the end he had none. And people remember when he sort of attempted to dive acrobatically in for his third, you know, perhaps having been denied his first two, and it went badly wrong. He lost the ball. And it's a bit sad, really, that, you know, in a lot of the references I've seen to him this week, that's the game that keeps getting mentioned, you know, and... A lot of these very steady performances for Wales are forgotten. I mean, in terms of the decision to go for him, you can go back to the original squad. He was a bit of a surprise selection there, wasn't he? Because if you think about it, Ewan Lloyd had come into the autumn um, and has been you know, really exciting for Bristol. Uh, Matt Prothero really informed for the Ospreys. But they went, as they had, as Pivak has done in a number of places, he went for more experienced figure in Amos. Um, and then, of course, events transpired, didn't they? You had Liam Williams suspended for all his selling off. And then you had um, the, the costliest reveal, gender reveal party we've ever seen with uh, Josh Adams. That's cost him his place. So he looked at it there. And they clearly had decided, given Jonathan Davis's ankle situation, the way they were going to go was with George North at 13, as they did against Italy. That's how they've been running. That's how they've been planning. That's been the game plan they've had in place. So... You can understand from that perspective where in terms of disruption, the simplest thing is to stick with that rather than bring Tompkins or Watkins in at 13 and then just make the straight swap at the wing. So you basically stick with essentially the same game plan, the same game approach. Now, 
you know, Watkin and Tompkins are experienced players. I'm sure could have stepped in, but that seems to be a key factor. Louis Rees Samuel was obviously going to play all along with North at 13. So they've gone for like for like. And if once they've gone like for like on the wing, well, Amos is the really the only player there. But as I say, you know, I really hope it goes well for him. I like Hallam. He's a bright, intelligent rugby player. He's always been the question mark, which has been there ever since Warren Gatlin raised it in 2016, about whether he has the top-end pace needed for a test winger. Gatlin said at that point he saw his future laying him out at fullback, which is where he largely features, you know, for Cardiff Blues and has done for the Dragons before that. But he's a steady winger, um, a clever winger, and what he will offer as well, on a positive perspective, very good under the high ball, and that's something that's going to be tested out, you know, with the bombs from Murray and Sexton. He's also good at chasing and reclaiming his own up and under, so I'm sure, I'm sure you'll see him do that a bit. I hope it goes well for him, and I hope that uh, after this game, people will stop talking about Uruguay. I've just written about it. I feel a bit uh, contradictory there, but there we are. I suppose uh, the other the other sort of thing that maybe isn't thought about too much when it comes to the George North at um, 13 selection. Obviously, you know, before this Josh Adams stuff happened, he would have been running alongside Johnny Williams in training, but you forget that he'd have finished the autumn running alongside Johnny Williams in training, was meant to face Italy. Uh, that, that partnership was obviously Johnny Williams pulled out uh, late on, so John Davis played. So there will be some semblance of a partnership between that pair, won't there, Matt? There will in some ways. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting, actually, I, when I asked Wayne Pivak about this, and, and he said it was a very quick decision that when Jonathan Davis came into camp with his injury, very quickly they decided that North was the man to fill that gap, which is a bit of a damning indictment of how he views Owen Watkin and uh, Nick Tompkins, to be honest. Um, but he's been running... So basically, North has been running there for the last two weeks in training uh, alongside Johnny Williams. They had a week uh, doing exactly the same thing in the autumn as well. Uh, so there will be some form of a partnership there, but they've never played together in, in those positions. Um, and it's still... You know, whilst North has played there a few times now down the years, it's not it's not his number one position. So, you know, whilst there is that that element of, I guess, some sort of familiarity between the two, uh, particularly in training, what they will have done, I guess, is established each other's roles, and you know, they'll they'll figure out just the little nuances in each other's games. Um, but th there's only so much you can do uh, behind closed doors. You, you know, there's no substitute for being. Uh, in the big match environment with each other. You look at the great partnerships that, that have been in the last few years, you know, thinking mainly back to Jamie Roberts and Jonathan Davis. Well, that partnership is forged in the test match environment. It's not really forged that much on the training field. Um, and it just comes with time as well. You know, the longer they spend together, the more they will obviously get to know each other. Um, so there's only so much you can do uh, in a controlled sort of training environment. Um, but I guess it, if you want to look at it literally, you know, it's not like they're strangers. They do know each other. Uh, they've been working on whatever game plan they're going to try and use on the weekend for a couple of weeks. Um, and at the end of the day, they're both top quality players as well. So you should it, you should expect them to, to be able to gel. Um, it's just my preference would have been, you know, I don't like moving players who are playing well. It's why I've always said I wouldn't like to see Josh Adams make that switch. Because I think if he's scoring tries on the wing, then just leave him on the wing. Um, that that would have been my preference in this in this situation. But the, like you said, Ben, they have trained together and they do know each other. You, you mentioned there, you know, sort of a bit of a damning indictment on the likes of Nick Tompkins and Owen Walking. We got a question here uh, from Jamie Phillips, uh, who's a Dragons fan, asking about Nick Tompkins. Just wants to know your thoughts. You know, since bulking up in lockdown, which was encouraged by Wayne Pivak and, and the Welsh management. You know, his stock has now fallen so far that George North is now considered a 13 contender above him. Now, it wasn't that long ago. It's only a year ago that he burst onto the scene in the Six Nations as this exciting, energetic 13 who, who sort of looked to solve a lot of Wales's centre issues. And, and now here we are 12 months later and he he's on the bench. Um, Sai, it's, it's been a slightly odd fall from, not, not fall from grace, but, you know, his stock's certainly fallen, has it? Well, as Jamie will know, it uh, the, the form Dragon Centre has not been Nip Com Tompkins. It's been a, it's been another elderly gentleman who um, I mean, it's an odd one, really. And if you, if you were to sit down now and say, right, who are the form Welsh centres at the moment? You're picking purely on form. You'd probably say Jamie Roberts at twelve and a Winokin at thirteen. You know, 
Toby Booth, Brock James and Mike Ruddock under him. Walking has moved out one more to 13. And it's looked really good. Seems to have, you know, shown his ability in a bit of space more as well. And it's a bit odd, certainly, as Matt says and alluded to, that you know Tompkins is ahead of him in the 23, really. Um, Tompkins is a bit of an enigma, really, isn't it? I mean, it was only sort of less than a year ago. Those are opening games against Italy when he came off the bench, scored a try. You know, the way he set up um, Tipperick's try um, against England. I, but it does seem that if we think back to what we were saying about him all during the, that championship, it was, oh, he's got such talent on the ball. He's so creative, just what Wales were looking for. Uh, but there are a few issues in defence. So how do, you, how do you sort out defence? Well, you know, you put a few pounds on, don't you? Hmm. So that's perhaps seen as a way to do it. Um, but that, the trouble is, his defence doesn't particularly seem to have moved up another gear, and he's not got the quite the dynamic spark he had when he was a bit lighter. So, interesting to see if you know if if, if the body shape changes again. You know whether they how they view his future. But it would be lovely, wouldn't it? You know to see him come on and make an impact in this game or during the championship because there is clearly you know there's a lot of talent in the boy. You know. You don't do what he's done with Saracens, and you don't show the glimpses he did last year without having something about you. It's just, it's just something needs to spark it again, doesn't it? Really. So um, I hope he comes through. But as you say, it is a reflection of the moment of how Pivac views his actual outside centre options. Once Jonathan Davis isn't there, he, he views their option, the options as being a wing. Absolutely. Yeah, um, we probably given more than enough airtime now to the sort of centre position. Let's move on elsewhere. Um, in terms of a starting pack, it's it's pretty strong. And um, we got a comment here uh, from Chris Roberts. You've got to love the back row, obviously. Sir Dan Lydiot's back in the starting 15 for the first time since 2018. How, how good is it to see him back? Uh, I suppose in the autumn, Wales did really sort of struggle finding that back row balance. Yeah, I mean... You know, it's interesting, as Wayne Pivak said today, he's exactly what we need uh, in round one. So I think what he's alluding to there is the physicality. Um, you know, Wales were were out-muscled quite a bit by the better teams in the autumn. Um, they were they were out-muscled at the breakdown. They were out-muscled on the gain line. Um, you know, other teams didn't struggle to generate quick ball. And part of that is because they were winning all the collisions on the gain line now. Dan Lydiot's not a man who loses many collisions. Um, so his physicality, particularly, you know, in defense, um, you know, is going to be important. But you look at you look at this side at the moment, and you know, Ken Owens has to be the same Ken Owens that we all know. Um, Alan Wynne Jones has to be the same Alan Wynne Jones that he has always been. Um, Josh Navidi, when he comes on, has got to be the same Josh Navidi. There's, there can't be any less than a 7 out of 10 from anybody on Sunday because Ireland, on paper, are too good. Um, now, that's a lot to ask of those players because, you know, Navidi hasn't played, you know, got a concussion, I think it was in August and, and has only played 20 minutes. Ken Owens has had 20 minutes since October. Alan Wynne-Jones hasn't played since the start of December. It's a big ask for those guys. But if Wales are to, to win on Sunday, they have to be the same players that they were when they last played. Um, and that's a big ask. And, and I guess you've got to include Dan Lydiot in that as well. You know, he's, he's played very well for the Ospreys of late, um, but he hasn't been playing at this level, you know, for the last few years. But he can't afford, he doesn't have the benefit of, of a couple of sort of minutes here and there to get his way into the game. He has to be on it from minute one. Um, now he's been around long enough to, to understand that for himself. Um, and I don't think he's going to be you know, shocked or surprised by anything. He's a guy who's got a lot of caps in the bank. Um, but, you know, he, you know, particularly up front, Wales will have done a lot of soul searching in the last couple of months because it didn't go well at all in the autumn, you know, on a lot of different levels. Um, so you'd expect, you'd expect some, some sort of reaction from those guys. But, you know, Dan Lydia, like I said, has been out of the camp for a while and, and, and a few other key individuals have missed a lot of rugby. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how they how they react. It's um, apologies first if you see two cats come into shot. My kittens have just arrived and they're looking very intrigued. I think they can see your beard, Ben, and they're getting very interested <laughs> in it once they're... Um, Lidget's an interesting one. Um, there's a couple of key phrases about him I, I thought that the listeners and the viewers might be interested in. Um, Sam Warburton, 
when he was talking in his uh, column, in the Times column at the weekend. He's big, obviously a big pals with Warburton, you know, with Lydia rather. He knows him well, knows what he can bring. They were a great combination together. And But he gave an insight, having been part of the Wales coaching setup for a year with Pivak. And he said, the Pivak's been looking for a big hitter. Um, obviously, there were people who, who can make contributions in defence. You know, we saw how many tackles Jim Botham made against England. Shane Lewis Hughes came through, and another youngster. But in terms of that really physical, you know, dump truck tackler, I mean, there's not many better than Lidget out there. He's a hugely physical, destructive defender. So he ticks that box. I mean, Navidi would as well to a large extent. But Josh has had just the one, maybe 30 minutes off the bench for the Blues after four months out concussion. So it, it makes sense, really. Uh, Josh is on the bench because Lidget has been just very consistent for the Ospreys. He's 33 now, and a lot of people might have thought his international days were behind him. But he's kept on plugging away for the Ospreys, kept on producing big physical performances, putting his body on the line week in, week out. And his form, Pivak said today, his form, he merited the selection. There's another thing Pivak said today, which is he called him hard-nosed. And he certainly is that. You know, he's a guy who's been through a lot. This is a guy who broke his neck playing for the Dragons in Perpignan when he was like 19 or 20. And he's kept on, kept on hammering away at people. You know, we hear the stories about people asking him not to tackle him and to damage his knees before he got into international rugby. Just a real honest, hardworking defender. And um, he will relish his return. And also, he may just have had, if he needed any added motivation, I think the words of Stephen Ferris, another blind side of another era, might stick in his mind, where he said he was past his bets and that the back row forwards of Ireland would be licking their lips. Well, I think there could be a few sore, bruised bodies in green, thanks to Mr. Ferris's words. And having listened to Dan talk today, um, he certainly still has a lot of belief in his ability. He's kept at it, he's kept working. Now he's got his reward, and good luck to him. Uh, there's a, this comment here, which... which pretty much sums up what, what Dan Lydia has done whenever he's played for Wales. And it's from Andrew Bevan saying, I can't remember Lydia ever really having a, a poor game for Wales. Even if you think back to his last time in the jersey, 2018, that autumn, he was still putting in good performances. And it's... I, I went into the 2019 World Cup squad selection still believing that Gatlin would find a place for him because I still thought if they could find room for someone like Dan Lydia, Gatlin would bend over backwards to do that. It didn't quite work out like that, but I, I just... It, 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 yeah, he just missed a bit too much rugby, Ben, though, hadn't he? Exactly, you know, yeah. He and I think, I remember talking to him in that summer, and he, 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 I think he came back in like the April time. It was just a bit too late, really. Exactly. Um, and, and if you think about where Wales were in the autumn with their back row, you know, there was a time when Falatau took a long time to get back into his rhythm. And it only felt like towards the end of the autumn, we started to see Falatau and Tiprick working well together. But the blind side was always a bit of a position up in the air. You know, you think Shane Lewis Hughes played there, Wayne Wright, I think, played there. All, all different players, I think both of them had a, had a couple of starts, or potentially one start at least, in that six jersey. And it just felt like they couldn't work out the balance to sort of counteract what Tiprick and Falatau are going to do. Well, if anyone's going to counteract it, it's going to be Dan Lydia, isn't it? Yeah, it kind of feels like, you know, when you're trying to think of an analogy that I can use, but you don't sort of realise what you've had until you go away from it for a few years. Um, and when I look at the Wales back row and, you know, I, I looked at Dan Lydia's quotes, which will be online later tonight as well, it kind of starts to feel a little bit like a safety blanket again. Um, you know, you, you kind of fell foul of this sort of idea that we needed more from players. You know, they couldn't just be a defender. You had to be a ball player. You had to offer something in other facets of the game, um, which I think was a criticism that was levelled at Lydia quite a bit. Uh, and it's probably, you know, that idea is what led to him sort of being phased out of the Wales squad. But when you look at the, the back row now, as it is, you know, you've got Falatau and Tipperick in there and Lydia as well. That's a back row that knows each other so well and you know exactly what you're going to get from each of them that maybe they might just bring the best out of each other. Um, you know, for, for the players that were involved in the autumn, Shane Lewis Hughes, Jim Botham, you know, Wayne Wright as well, a, a bit before that, they, they're all fantastic players and have got um, various assets and, a, you know, in their own, own right, really good uh, flankers. But when you play with people who you know and you're established with them, um, good mates with them off the field as well, I think it's all going to play a part. And I, and I think there's a good chance that they might all just sort of 
bring the best out of each other. And maybe, just maybe, with all this talk about you know trying to do loads of different things with the attack, changing the way we defend, et cetera, et cetera, from the Wales camp, maybe just going back to basics and doing the the, the basic stuff well, it, it, maybe that'll be enough to spark Wales into a good performance. I don't know. Um, but there's just that's how it feels to me. It's almost like, okay, we're just going to go back to the, strip it all back a little bit. Dan Lydiot's back in. Just feels like a little bit of a, a safety blanket, really, because I don't, maybe it's not going to be as show stopping as other players can be, but it, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to make many mistakes. So, you know, let's use that as a starting point. I think there's no doubt. I said this before a few times. Tipperick and Faleto just can dovetail in a way that I've seen few Welsh forwards do. You saw it against Italy. Joy to watch, really. Devastating double act. But they're able to do that at their best when the third member of the back row is a grafting, hard-hitting, physical dog of a player. You can have Navidi do that role. You could have Lydia do that role. Um, it's quite a difficult role to fulfil. You know, the, the best blind sides in the world are really, really influential players, you know. Um, I think Lydia has deserved it on form. And I think the two players alongside him in the back row will have huge respect going into the game for what they know he will do, enabling them to flourish. Um, and I hope he has a big game. Uh, and I do think that against the big ball-carrying Irish players, they have a lot of ball-carrying options, he will have a vital role to play. I always go back to what Sean Edwards said, and Sean Edwards would have had him just about first name on his team sheet. And... Um, that says a lot about his defensive acumen, doesn't it? Absolutely. Uh, the thing that's always, I feel, is always overlooked with Lydia is, that is he's not the biggest ball carrier, but the presentation is always, almost always, nearly perfect, which Wales have struggled with in the last year when it comes to generating quick ball. It's not always been the presentation that's let them down rather than just the big ball carrying. So hopefully you can add a little bit onto that. Let's move into another part of the team. Um, that's the second row. Another little bit of a surprise. Adam Beard, having not been in the autumn squad, is now starting the Six Nations. Um, what, do we, what do we make of that decision? I, I just I'll say a little quick bit on that before Matt comes on. I wrote about Beard earlier today, and I think um, there's a couple of things. It's not being exactly clear what the injury situation is with Jake Ball and Corey Hill, but we know there's been injury issues with them of late. That might have had a bearing there. Um, Beard's a real turnaround because he wasn't in the autumn squad but he's grafted away for the Ospreys like Lydia has done, has deserved his call-up. Um, and what he will bring is this a real a horses for courses selection, in my view. I talked about the Irish ball carriers. Their other big strength, traditionally, is their line-out drive, their maul play. And there is nobody better in Welsh rugby at, at, at maul defence um, than Beard. He's a real sort of successor to Luke Charteris in that role with his uh, Professor Gadget uh, a telescopic reach he, there's no one better you want to get in there disrupt cause mayhem get his arms across the mall slow it down get those turnovers and he'll have a big big role to play in that and he's also six foot eight you know and if you look at it the lineup has been an area where we'll certainly struggled in the autumn it was their big achilles heel and he does provide that height option there and you've got another height option on the bench in will Rowlands. so you can understand the selection i think um form and taking the opposition into account. Yeah, I, I felt particularly Ireland. Ireland almost mocked us in in the autumn. You think back to that game in Dublin; they were they were effectively mocking us at the line out. They had they were packing the, the tail of the line out with two pods with Tygburn and and Peter Omani, basically daring Wales just to take the safe ball and, and go to the front. And, and Wales want to be ambitious with their line out. They didn't do that. They went to the tail. They lost it. So. It felt like Ireland were, were sort of taking the mick a bit out of Wales' line. I suppose putting in someone, you know, Warren Gatlin said you can't coach someone to be that tall. That's that's a pretty good first step to, to making a fix, isn't it, Matt? Yeah, I guess so. And, you know, Adam Beard at times as well has been in charge of the line out. Um, so, you know, he's a very good operator in that in that department. Um, but, you know, it, I, I don't think it's, I don't think we can say that just because Adam Beard comes into the side that Wales is problems at that in that area are just going to disappear um clearly there were some systematic problems there because it wasn't just 
you know, a one-off. It was it was an issue throughout the entire campaign uh, in the autumn. So they clearly had time, whatever it was, timing issues as well, throwing problems. You know, it, it it it's a mixture of things. Yeah, you know, we we were hard on the hookers in the autumn. You know, I, I was as well. Uh, but it's not just them. Um, you know, there there has to be that relationship with the lifters and the jumpers um, to to get things right. Now, some of the throwing I've seen at regional level in the last few weeks hasn't filled me with confidence. Uh, um, you know, it, it hasn't been great. Uh, I'm afraid to say, but you know, Adam Beard perhaps freshens things up. Like you say, he's a big bloke, um, and he is good in that area. Ireland are definitely going to target Wales there, though. Uh, you know, Paul O'Connell coming into their setup is only going to do one thing for their lineout. Um, and like you said, Ben, they had so much joy there against Wales out in Dublin uh, in the autumn that they're definitely going to fancy themselves at, at the lineout and. And of course, the scrum. Just, just on the whole, it, it's a very experienced Wales team. I think I saw some stats saying it's it's one of the most, if not the most, experienced team in terms of caps picked in the Six Nations by Wales. Um, the pack in particular looks like a, a very strong pack. What do we think about the bench? How is that going to influence us? Because the Ireland twenty through twenty three looks strong throughout. Do we potentially see Wales falling off in this match? Well, if you look at the Irish bench, they've got Dave Kilcoyne, you know, who adds real ball carrying home foot, as Lou said. And they've got a certain Tyke Furlong at, at um, tight end. Now, I watched the, the Scarlet's Leinster game, I think Matt did as well. And you gave Phil Price quite an, after, <laughs> quite an outing there, didn't he? And yeah, you know, world class tight end. Obviously, had limited rugby over the last year. But those are real big, powerful men to come off the bench. If you look at Wales, well, realistically, you need Win Jones. And Thomas Francis to have a, a long day at the office, don't you? In a good sense, you'd you'd want them to go well past the hour mark, really. Um, now, in fairness, you've got people on the bench in Rodri Jones and Leon Brown who will offer work rate. Um, Rodri's a big, you know, big tackling machine, um, and Leon Brown, we know, it can be a very powerful carrier. Last fifteen minutes, they can offer, but you you probably wouldn't want. To, you certainly wouldn't want when you're starting props to go down with an injury in the first fifteen minutes. Um, because on the loose end, we're without Nicky Smith and Rob Evans, two experienced strong scrimmage in uh, loose heads. On the tight end, there's no Samson Lee concussed. Will Griff John, somewhat surprisingly to me, not in the squad. So you've really got, you're looking at two real strong scrimmages in Francis and Wynne Jones. You need them to stay fit, you really do. And, and then maybe sort of further down the sort of the bench. Gareth Davis obviously uh, makes sense in terms of scrum half and cover. W would you have considered going with Jared Evans over Callum Sheedy, given Jared's form sort of over the Christmas derbies? Yeah, this this you could argue that. Um, you know, I watched the Blues a lot uh, over Christmas, and Jared Evans was outstanding, um, particularly in the in the back to back games against the Scarlets. Really caused them problems uh, in both matches, uh, but I just think. I think you've got to try and anticipate what, what the game is going to be like on Sunday. Um, I think Wales are going to be playing off the back foot quite a lot. Uh, I don't think it's going to be high in the entertainment stakes. Um, and I'm not really sure that's that's the kind of environment in which Jared Evans thrives. You know, on the front foot, don't get me wrong, you know, when he's on the front foot, he's got quick, clean ball and he's running at disorganised defences, then th there's nothing worse for, for a defender. Um but I just think it's going to be a day for pragmatism, um, a day where the kicking game is going to be important, even in you know even in the in the sort of dying embers of the match. Um, you know, I think it's a toss up really between him and him and Callum Sheedy, uh, but but I can understand the selection. Um, you know, I think Jared Evans is in the squad, uh, and rightly or wrongly, he's only really in there because other options were cut off, um, or or injuries have dictated. Um, you know, whether that people will agree with that or not, I think that's why the decision has been made. Um, so I, I don't think it's, there's much in it between Sheedy and, uh, and Jared Evans, but I can understand why Wayne Pivak has gone this way. And, and at the end of the day, you know, Sheedy's not been playing poorly and he's, he's playing in a very good side at a very high level week in, week out. I, I'm not surprised by it, uh, Ben, because um, Matt's alluded to it there. I think if Reese Priestland had been available, he would have been in the squad ahead of Jared. I'm not convinced that Pivak sees Jared as, um, you know, a leading option at outside half. Uh, it's 
the one one of the selections or one of the emissions rather which is getting the most reaction from fans because jared ticks a lot of boxes for those people who see a welsh fly half as someone who should play in a particular way with his ability of ball in hand his sidestepping ability his defense splitting ability lovely player to watch one of the best players ball in hand in europe at 10. um as ever rather predictably rather boringly i'm going to say it again there will be the issue pointed about his, his kicking of a hand, which tends to leave you perhaps a bit short in distance when he goes for touch, and his game control and tactical management. That that can be the only reason why you don't go for him, because as an attacking force, he is our most talented 10. But clearly, Pivak's going in another direction, so and that that's that. The other thing which we haven't talked about, um, perhaps it touches on, as well as the the replacement issues with Navidi, if I do have a... Um, of an abiding concern looking at this game is looking at the Irish team, the starting team, and their options and their arsenal over the ball. The way they've gone, they've gone tight burn. Well, I've never seen a second row like him over the ball in my life. They've got because of the injury to Doris, uh, Caelan Doris, they've brought Van der Fleer in at seven, more of a traditional open side fetcher over the ball. Although Marnie is obviously very adept over the ball, adept over the ball, Fleer will be getting to that breakdown quicker. And in the, under the modern interpretations, it's getting there quick and getting an immediate lift is the key. And they've also got Andrew Porter, who's one of the best props in the world over the ball. Now, that does worry me a little bit when I look at the makeup, makeup of the Welsh pack. Probably the best player over the ball in that Welsh pack is Wynne Jones. Um, Tipper has got loads and loads of strengths. Uh, but obviously we know that he's, he's not an over-the-ball player in the way that some other sevens are. He's, he's a consummate player in all in, in all aspects. Um, but I, can, I do fear slightly him becoming, you know, triple-teamed by those Irish players coming in over the ball. So there really needs to be a collective effort by was the breakdown because it was such a problem there. Yeah? You know, let's not remember, I think it was half-time in the Italy game. Brian Abana was talking, and I think he described the Welsh... Uh, breakdown players atrocious or appalling. It was some such adjective. It wasn't a complimentary one. Mm. And they say come on the back of Wales conceding eight penalties, eight penalties in the first half of the breakdown against against Italy, finding all different kinds of ways of messing it up there. And it comes back to the same thing with the line out. Unless they can sort the line out, unless they can sort the breakdown, they will lose this game. Unless the scrum stay solid, they will lose this game. All that opening 20 minutes we had about the wing, the fullback, the centre. <laughs> if it all goes wrong in the way they went wrong in Dublin before and in Thnetley before in the autumn, we will lose this game. So, nice positive note. Could, could Wales then potentially take a leaf out of the traditional Irish Irish book, which is the choke tackle? That's something that I think is it, it, it's a sort of tackle I've seen sort of Dan Liddy in particular sort of start to use more in, in in recent years for the Ospreys, I think the Scarlets had success with it when they beat Bath away from home. That's that's one way to sort of get around things when you're not really got yeah, jackal that's threats. That's true. But there are still going to be occasions when the ball's going to go to the deck, isn't there? Um, it's going to be tackle situations. You know, whatever we say, I'm sure they will look to employ the choke. I'm sure both sides will. Uh, but it, it's just become the most important part of the game above anything else, and Wales above all have to find a way they have to find a way of slowing down a stealing ball and they have to find a way of delivering quicker ball because they have struggled so much in the autumn to clear it away and get the ball provided for their backs you just hope that whatever they've been working on in training they, they can find a way of achieving that just on that ben that the choke tackle rule for me is probably the worst rule in rugby. Um, I hate it with a passion. I think it's, it encourages negative rugby. Um, There's a few contenders, you know, might be. You know, the idea where if you can hold somebody up for long enough and then everybody can fall wherever they want when the ball hits the deck and kill it, I think is such a negative rule and should be sent to Mars. But I, what I am interested to see is how Wales do defend in this match because, you know, let's not forget now Byron Hayward is gone. Uh, Gethin Jenkins is in, in his place to take over the defensive duties and Gethin has now had you know, a two-week run at this to, to prepare his side. And obviously, Gethin Jenkins played a lot under Sean Edwards and was was part of that side that really um, employed this, this high-intense blitz defence that Ireland have struggled against at times in the past. Under Byron Hayward, we saw... <laughs> 
well, to be kind with mixed success, um, we saw them go towards this drift defence um, and encourage teams to go to the wide outside. And, you know, we think back to the game, I think it was the Six Nations game against Ireland, where they, they almost found, you know, George North was defending 40-odd metres of the pitch at times. It was calamitous, really. Um, so I'm intrigued to see if, if Wales go now go back to a defensive system that Gethin will be familiar with insofar as just getting off the line and, and blitzing and blitzing and blitzing. Now, of course, to do that, you have to be incredibly fit and incredibly accurate. Um, but I think if they can get that right, that may be a, a, a big chance because if you stand off Ireland and let them play, then you, they can bamboozle you behind, you know, Sexton and their centres. The running lines that those guys hit, sometimes it's almost impossible to defend. You cannot stand off them. So I'm intrigued to see whether or not Wales stick with this drift in defence that they had they had employed at times or whether they decide to get off the line with a bit more gusto. That's a very good point because if you look back at the autumn sequence, Barry and Harry lost, lost his job. I think very much on the back of that Oh, it was shambolic defensive display out in Paris where there were dog legs all over the place. You know, we'd become so used to the kind of regimented defense into Sean Edwards coming up as one red wave. Then what you saw when Gethin took over, obviously with very little time to work with the squad, um, I think it was um, the game potentially against, um, might have been Ireland away. It was one of the early games after Barry and Hayward had gone. And what you were seeing a lot was in this real determination to get off the line and replicate that Edward style blitz. You had actually people stepping up offside mm -hmm. and it was putting us on the back foot continuously. It's a real, it's, it's such a, um, a narrow margin with the timing, isn't there? And so much of it, I guess, comes from um, Jonathan Davis setting the tone at outside centre. And going back to George North, that's another thing. He's going to have an important role, isn't he? Especially when the ball is going wide, getting that, um, that drift on the money. It's, it, there's not much margin for error with it, you know? So, but, but I mean, Gethin, I saw Adam Jones was, was talking um, one of the papers this morning, talking about how Gethin effectively coached the team when he was playing for them, barking orders left, right and centre. So he's somebody who fits into that role well. And I think he will enjoy working with quality players. Uh, has he had enough time to put it an Edward stamp on it? I guess we'll find out over the weekend. Indeed. Well, I guess that leaves us with just one more thing to do, and that's the predictions. How do we see this one going? Man, I'll say one thing before that, just as um, because I think we need to say we're finished with the predictions. I think we all need to uh, say our condolences to the family of, family of John Pullen. Um, it's from an era, a rugby player from an era that I was uh, very much there for, and uh, he was a, a tremendous hooker. Uh, people will remember he was the only Welshman involved in arguably the greatest, only non-Welshman rather, involved in arguably the greatest try of all time for the Barbarians in 1973. But uh, perhaps his greatest moment was off the field when. After the 1972 match against Ireland, Wales and Scotland had declined to go out to, uh, because of the troubles in Ireland. England went. And after the match, John Pullen, who was captain, said, we may not be any good, but at least we turned up. And uh, he was just a very, very great player, um, one of England's finest forwards of his generation. And rest in peace, John, condolences to his family. Indeed. Um, right then, Matt, how, how do you see the game going? Yeah, well, you know, taking into account everything we've discussed, um, basically, if Wales don't get some parity up front, then they might as well not leave the changing room because it all starts there. Um, you know, I can't, Wales can't compete in this match unless they win their own ball at a set piece um, and provide some sort of platform. Um, you know, I, I can't confidently say Wales are going to win this match. Nothing points in that direction. I'd be happy to be proven wrong. Um, come Sunday on this, but right now um, I don't think anything other than an island victory is looking likely, unfortunately. And, I, you know, it's not nice to, to back against back against Wales in that fashion. But, you know, if they were to win um, in the face of all the adversity that they've that they've encountered this week, then it would come as a surprise. Now, in the past, we, we would say don't write Wales off because we've seen it before. They don't mind it when they're when their backs are against the wall like this and everybody's writing them off. Um, but I think if you look at the look at the teams on paper, you know, Wales are very, uh, fairly disrupted by the events of this week. Um, their back line is looking unfamiliar, uh, whereas Ireland is looking like a very formidable side. So I think it's going to be an Ireland victory, unfortunately. I'm going to ask um, this little fella for his prediction. What do you think? Uh, he's gone for an Ireland win. Unfortunate, that. 
Um, hmm. Let's be realistic about it. Wales lost 32 9, I think it was, in Dublin in the Nations Cup. Um, you then come along to the game in Cardiff and you think, oh, home advantage. But of course, that's gone, isn't it? It's, it's negated. You, you know, the home crowd, the, the Millennium Stadium, 70,000 odd, that would have been a big factor. You'd think perhaps that could have helped drive Wales on. That element's going to be taken out of it. So it's just two teams in an empty stadium. I think Wales probably do have a stronger lineup than played in that game. Certainly up front, it looks a bit stronger. But my concern, Matt and Ben, is just in the autumn, Wales just found different ways every week of getting things wrong. You know, it was one week it was the defence, then went one week it was the scrum, then it was the breakdown, and all the way through it was the line out. And it just concerns me that there are too many moving parts that are still error strewn coming out of the back of that. Can they really have sorted all those different aspects out? We often talk, don't we, about a side that, you know, lays in fits and starts, and if they could get it, get it all right together, how good they'd be. Imagine if Wales got all the things they're getting wrong together at the same time, you know? Just a lot of issues to resolve, and it only needs a couple of those to go wrong. So as much as I'd love to see them sort it all out, because I like Pivak, I like Stephen Jones, I like a lot of the players involved in this team, you want them to do well. Just can't see Wales winning, unfortunately. It would be Meles. It would be very sweet in Welsh if Wales did win, but I can't see it. I think that's two uh, Irish victories, then, is it? Three with a cat. Oh, three. <laughs> Sorry, right. Well, there we go, then. That's a, a slight downer to end on. Um, so that's it for our Facebook Live. But you can catch all the latest news and the build up to Sunday's match on Wales Online.